the environment in the south of Chases, um, which I think all of you know about, and if not, I'll tell you more. Um, of course, there's a lecture series, and so we're pleased to welcome the next speaker in our lecture series, Dr. Jay Malone, who is originally from Mississippi. Um, but I suspect he might be a Gator fan. All of his degrees are from Florida, um, including his PhD in 1996. He specializes in uh, biography, I suppose. This is something that, among other things, I mean, of course, it's true. Um, and in 1998, he became the very first executive director of the History of Science Society, which, of course, um, has all sorts of obligations, not just overseeing committees, but um, outreach um, and I think especially in this time, uh, we become aware of the role of advocacy and really um, pushing for you know, sort of a, a more general recognition of not just the role of humanities and the sciences, that's what I wrote down in my notes here, but I think that you know, the sciences and humanities are part of the same project and they are intertwined. Um, and so under um, Jay's very able uh, leadership, I think that you know, HSS has weathered various you know, kind of skirmishes and storms and is stronger for it. Um, especially, again, because I think the society is actually quite responsive and, and forward-thinking, and it's a society that I think its membership is rather proud of. Um, and so, of course, you know, Jay is, is the face of HSS and has been as long as I've been part of it. Um, and we were talking about this just the other day in our discussion group, how um, whether by personality or design, um, he is often the good cop. And um, so, um, that's not the that form. This is, this is group cop, um, Dr. Jay Malone, who's going to talk to us today about science in old Mississippi, bringing science and humanity to the people. Thank you, Alex. So, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, as Alex said, I am uh, a native Mississippian. Um, I haven't lived in Mississippi since the 70s, uh, but I still consider it my home. Um, and one of the things that I've learned recently about advocacy is that if you're going to talk about advocacy, you should include feeling in it. So I'm going to be very feeling, uh, probably more so than I should, uh, in this talk. Um, this past uh, week, there was a National Public Radio spot about um, a student at that other university in Mississippi, um, <laughs> African-American student, uh, who was talking about what it was like to be uh, at the University of Mississippi. And in that piece, uh, I should have asked, can you guys hear me okay in the back? Is the, okay. In that piece, they talk about uh, James Meredith, who many of you remember was the first African American to attend the University of Mississippi. And this is uh, inscribed on the wall at Ole Miss, always without fail, regardless of the number of times I enter Mississippi, it creates within me feelings that are felt at no other time joy, hope, and love. So when I crossed the border from Tennessee, driving from Indiana uh, this morning, uh, I experienced that when I come to Mississippi, this idea of joy and hope, and hope, I think, is the primary thing, and love, a love of place. Uh, what uh, Meredith continues in his memoir is this idea of sadness. Now, his sense of sadness in entering Mississippi and mine probably couldn't be more different, but there is a sense of sadness about, about the state, about the possibilities that are inherent in Mississippi and, and the hope that these possibilities will be realized. So what I'd like to talk to you today about is a sense of sharing this hope with others, primarily other Mississippians. So they always say that you should tell people what you're going to say and say it and then tell them what you said. I'm going to provide a rough sketch of science's evolution in America using the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, as a template. I'm going to argue for the increasing need to explain the pub to the public the nature of science and the role that the History of Science Society plays in that. And I'm going to tell some stories of science set in the Old Southwest to try to show science's humanity. Now, this isn't a linear talk. I'm going to be jumping back and forth in time. Um, but this, I'm hoping, will encompass everything that, I'll, that I will discuss today. And just as a quick point, the Old Southwest is that area of the United States uh, where the Mississippi River was the western terminus. And so this area of Mississippi was considered uh, the Southwest, or now it's called the Old Southwest. 
So this is from the AAAS website. 1848 marked the emergence of a national scientific community in the United States. While science was a part of the American scene from the nation's early days, its practitioners remained few in number and scattered geographically and among disciplines. AAAS was the first permanent organization formed to promote the development of science and engineering at the national level and to participate or, and to represent the interests of all its disciplines. Participants in AAAS meetings held in cities across the country represented a who's who of science. Now there's two things I want to uh, take issue with this statement. If you're a member of the American Philosophical Society, which was formed in 1743 in Philadelphia, Benjamin Franklin was one of the uh, originators and is still thriving today in Philadelphia, you might take exception to a group that was formed in 1848 to calling themselves the first. Uh, also, if you're a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which was formed in Boston in 1780, uh, still going strong in Cambridge, uh, you too might take exception. But we can maybe qualify this in certain ways about all the disciplines and things like that. The idea that it was a who's who of science, um, what constitutes the, the cream of science uh, traditionally has been taken from biographical works, particularly the Dictionary of American Biography. And you look at things like publications and meetings attended and things like that. And one of the things that we've discovered with the DAB is a very northern centric emphasis. And so people who practice science in the old southwest or in the south in general are typically overlooked in any kind of who's who of science. So one of the things that I wanted to do uh, working on the, my dissertation was to look at these people who I would um, say have been largely forgotten. Continuing, the meetings were covered widely by newspapers. <laughs> so those of you that are younger, um, I was watching a, a little uh, game that these kids were playing where you put a uh, word on your forehead and, you, and they, people give you clues to try to guess what it was. And the clue was, old people read this in the morning. And the answer, of course, was a newspaper. Um, so <laughs> um, but uh, you know, they're still around, not as many as there used to be. Uh, but sometimes these AAAS proceedings would be printed verbatim. So every word that was uttered there would appear in the newspaper. However, AAAS's permanence was not preordained, and despite the many contributions it made during its first 50 years, the association came close to extinction more than once. Ultimately, an alliance with Science Magazine, which had failed as a private venture, rejuvenated both the magazine and AAAS. So historians, particularly historians of science, are familiar with this idea of failure and rejuvenation, and I'm going to give you two examples here. The Mississippi Society for the Acquisition and Dissemination of Useful Knowledge, or I like to call MISADUC, was established in 1803 and was the first scientific society uh, in Mississippi. ISIS, and let me say quickly that I'm talking about the academic journal ISIS and not some other group, uh, which was established in 1912, uh, and the History of Science Society was responsible for taking ISIS, uh, keeping ISIS from folding. Uh, the society was specifically founded to support ISIS. So for the Mississippi Society for the Acquisition and Dissemination of, of Useful Knowledge, the second territorial governor for Mississippi was William C.C. C. Claiborne. Uh, his birth dates are, say, 1773. Some people put him at 1775, which would mean that he was elected to the House of Representatives before he was age 25, which goes against the Constitution. So we're going to give him a little bit of error here. He was governor of the Mississippi Territory, a Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson appointee, 1801 to 1803. Here's what Claiborne said. Every government ought to direct its views to the advancement of literature. And the very preservation of a Republican government in its genuine purity depends upon a diffusion of knowledge among the body of society. This is integral to places like Mississippi and to the republic as large. Anyone who lives in a republic has a responsibility for sharing in the knowledge for the body of the society. And he went on, a great statement has said, and the experience of all ages supports the position that science is the only agent which can hold tyranny and bigotry in check. 
Now remember, this is happening after the French Revolution in the 1790s, and there's a strong sense, an enlightenment sense, that science can solve lots of the problems that uh, civilizations have seen. And Claiborne and others are dedicated to the proposition that they will uh, pursue uh, science and knowledge. So to promote science, Claiborne proposed a seminary of learning that would become a fruitful nursery of science and virtue. We'll talk more about this later. And a society of gentlemen that were located in the uh, area close to Natchez, Mississippi, uh, devoted, uh, were, was formed to devote the uh, nurture and spread of scientific knowledge. So on October 1st, 1803, 11 men uh, meet to adopt a constitution for the society. The preamble pledges the men to advance agriculture, notice that's first, and other useful arts. They lament their distance from the fraternity of science and embrace the need for a systematic analysis of scientific advances because by science only can mankind attain any certain or perfect enjoyment of the munificence of nature. So this, you can see, is a recurring theme throughout the early period of, of Mississippi. So in October 5th, 1803, the House of Territory directs William Dunbar, more on Dunbar later, to address the governor's concern for agriculture, literature, and science and to report by bill. October 8th, Dunbar submits the bill and act to incorporate the Mississippi Society for the Acquirement of Useful Knowledge. November 18th, Claiborne signs the bill. This is from the Constitution of Missaduck. The Society will collect, quote, books, manuscripts, maps, drafts, drawings, paintings, engravings, papers, mathematical and other instruments and apparatus, specimens of natural productions of the animal, vegetable, or fossil kingdom, antiques, coins, metals, and all others. This is the nature of science in 1803 in the United States. Uh, it's not an area where there's discrete specialization. It's the universe, in essence, of trying to understand nature and its entirety. And people might have different preferences and so forth, but their purview is pretty much everything. Natural history and also uh, drafts and, and, uh, and scientific instruments. But the society struggles in the political climate with Republicans claiming that it, it's a Federalist group in disguise. Although its president, Isaac Briggs, who was a surveyor that came down to the Mississippi Territory, is a Jefferson appointee, and Claiborne, another Jefferson uh, appointee, is one of the vice presidents of the society. So I've been unable to find the minutes and activities of Missaduck, and the last mention I can find of the group is in 1824. So around 21 years or so it managed to hang on, where the last few members, not enough to form a quorum, bequeath the collection of books, some 200 volumes, to Jefferson College uh, near Natchez. And, and you can still see the buildings of Jefferson College there. This is the seminary of learning that Claiborne was hoping to establish. So HSS rescues ISIS, our other example here. ISIS was established by uh, George Sarton, uh, Pictured here in his younger days, he's a uh, Belgian, born in Ghent. He received his PhD in mathematics in 1911, uh, but early on was devoted to the idea that math, science, history, the humanities in general are all interlinked and that it's important that they, this inter, these interconnections be explored. Sarton is famous for the quotation, scientific activity is the only human activity that is cumulative and progressive. Now, your teachers are going to complicate that a little bit for you. I put it in my graduate school admission paper and they still let me in, um, which is, I find, <laughs> enormously surprising. Um, the idea that science is the only activity that is cumulative and progressive has been um, most notably by uh, Thomas Kuhn in the Structure of uh, Scientific Revolutions to need a few qualifications. So here's uh, ISIS today. And this is from the, the masthead of ISIS. The History of Science Society was founded in 1924 to secure the future of ISIS. The international review that George Sarton founded in Belgium in 1912. Since 1984, the publication of ISIS has been supported in part by an endowment from the Dibner Fund. Now there's a lot in here. Notice that this is an international review. The first issue of ISIS, which appeared in 1913, contained articles in French and German uh, and in English. The um, editorial introduction was written by Sarton in French. The History of Science Society is an international society, and this is important. 
Uh, science is an international activity, and the HSS believes it's imperative that there be international participation in the history of science, that it, otherwise we're not going to completely understand how science operates. And ISIS, the very title, speaks to that sense of East and West uh, coming together. We've been lucky that we've had supporters like Bern Dibner, who made a fortune in uh, electronics, who um, had a deep interest in Einstein, and we happened to have a president of the society who was an expert in Einstein who befriended Byrne, and uh, he gave us lots of money that allowed us to do many things, such as me standing before you here today. So the society forms, it's a byproduct of AAAS. So in the early 1920s, members of Section L, Section L is the history and philosophy of science, and these are mostly scientists that are discussing this, um, talk about a formation of a society to support ISIS, and the founders of HSS meet in the offices of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which were in Boston at the time, to establish formally the HSS, their intent to foster the interests and the study of the history of science, and also to support a journal devoted to this subject of research. So this is HSS, uh, incorporated in District of Columbia in 1924. So we're closing in on our centennial. Now, what does science look like today? And using the AAAS as a template. Out of curiosity, how many of you are members of AAAS? Just, okay. Um, I would recommend anyone that you go to that meeting. The next meeting will be in Austin, Texas. 10 hour drive from here? 10 hours, you think? Less than 10? Okay. Austin's a fabulous town, and a, a AAAS doesn't typically do, go there. AAAS typically doesn't come into the South at all. So I would recommend, uh, if you have at all, you know, the resources, and you maybe get pool resources, that you go to the, it's always the President's Day weekend. I don't know if you guys get class off uh, President's Day, but it's a, it's a fabulous meeting. Um, the, it's divided, the AAAS is divided into 24 sections that correspond to the uh, members' field of interest, about 120,000 members, that membership fluctuates, it's growing. Over 260 societies affiliated with AAAS, ranging from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics to the Wildlife Society. Included in the affiliates are HSS, the Society for the History of Technology, and the Society for the Social Study of Science, but not the American Association for the History of Medicine or the American Society for Environmental History. And there's a reason, I think, for that, is that most of the academic societies and, and Almost all of your professors are involved in some way in an academic society, and it's my job to try to convince them to volunteer their valuable time to do things for places like the History of Science Society outside of what they're doing at the university. And it's important work. Without what your professors and, and other folks do for the HSS, we would not exist. It's extremely valuable work. We're lucky in that we have a paid executive office. Folks like the AHM and ASEH don't have the resources that we have. And so affiliation and all the, the follow-up and things like that is very difficult for these smaller societies. So this is one of the reasons that the, our groups try to, to collaborate as much as we can to try to share information. There are 47 affiliated academies of science are also allied with AAAS. Almost all of the state academies, including the Mississippi Academy of Science, the representative from the Mississippi Academy was at the meeting uh, two weeks ago in Boston. Here are the 24 sections. I won't read them all, but it gives you a sense of how science is organized in this country today. Uh, so alphabetically, agricultural, food, and renewable resources. So those whose research interests uh, figure in this area are affiliated with this, this section. A astronomy would be an old section. Biological sciences is by far the largest section at AAAS, as you would probably expect. Here's the History and Philosophy of Science, Section L, where HSS got its start. Uh, I'm the HSS delegate to the Section X, the societal impacts of science and engineering, trying to carry to the, to the world the effects that science and engineering have on, on our civilization. But you can see all the different groups, disciplines that are represented here. And I think this is, this is interesting because how science is divided reflects I think, how science is practiced. And you'll notice that it's the history of science society. It's not the history of sciences society. We're very ecumenical in the way that we consider science. 
And to give you an idea of the specialization that you have in the fellows, uh, these are uh, members of the AAAS who are nominated for excellence or distinguished contributions in different fields. Uh, the, here's a few samples from the fellowship elections this past, um, this past year. For distinguished contributions to understanding plant virus satellite agents, development of a brachypodium for genomic studies of infection, and research on the history of plant pathology. This is, uh, whoops, I'm just going the wrong way. Um, that was from uh, Karen Beth Scholtoff, who's a plant pathologist uh, botanist at Texas A&M, who is the um, chair of our committee on meetings and programs. And it's, I think it's very important that HSS have a scientific presence or a continuing scientific presence in its meetings. And I'm delighted that people, scientists, trained scientists like Karen are a part of the group. Uh, science is, uh, has a, what they call the family of journals. The science is the, um, uh, the, the mainstay, the one that was rescued in the 19th century. Science immunology, science robotics. AAAS hopes that this will be the clearinghouse for all things robotics. Uh, translational medicine, uh, cell signaling, science signaling, and science advances, which is open access. And so I'd encourage uh, any of you who have an internet connection, which I would imagine is most of you, uh, to look at science advances. It's, these are easy to understand short articles that give you an, a sense of what scientific research uh, is about. So as we start thinking about how we describe science to, to others, we get a sense of that it's big and it's messy and it's complicated and it's imperfect. And so the idea is what do we tell other people about it? So the most important rule in advocacy is to know your audience. And by audience, I mean, in this case, the voting public. And so here's the task before us. Democrats and Republicans are not enemies. We are opponents with a common goal. And the one thing that I want to emphasize on this talk is it's not partisanship at all. It's actually anti-partisanship because I think that the pursuit of science requires that we all participate together that we be as broad, uh, broadly encompassing as we, we can be. Because the common goal is a healthy republic. And I think Claiborne, Jefferson, and those recognize this goal of a healthy republic. And irrespective of what you think about uh, politicians, they do listen to voters. Uh, that is uh, an important part of who they are and, and what they do in the pursuit of a healthy republic. So, who are the voters and what are we going to tell them? So I'm going to give you what are called the Naomi Oreskes Rules of Engagement. Uh, Naomi is a member of the History of Science Society. She's gained most fame from a book that she co-authored with Eric Conway, The Merchants of Doubt, looking at the history of the tobacco industry and different groups that tried to sow doubt about scientific evidence and scientific facts. It's a, a field growing in importance called agnotology, the manufacture of ignorance. And if people believe, and in the tobacco industry believe this strongly, that if you can cast doubt about scientific foundings, findings, then you're able to uh, stave off uh, what uh, changes are in store. One of the things that Naomi and Eric discovered in Merchants of Doubt is that there's a fundamental um, opposition to big government in, in a lot of these, these cases, that people don't want the government involved in any kind of regulation, and they're gonna push back, and push back in many cases very hard against uh, any kind of government interference. Naomi, when talking about advocacy, says you keep the message simple. I'm not sure if I'm doing that today. Uh, tell a story, and then you make it stick, and it must be personal and emotional, and that part I think I can nail. And this works for politicians too. In two weeks, I'll be going to Capitol Hill and I'll be trying to convince the delegation from Indiana that funding the National Endowment for the Humanities is crucial to the health of this republic. So, um, the sign's not exactly right. I'm gonna ask you to turn your clock back 210 years. Um, but there's a sense that I felt whenever I told someone that I was from Mississippi that So how many of you are on uh, Facebook, just out of curiosity? So I, the only time I've unfriended someone on Facebook is they made fun of Mississippi. So, <laughs> so it's, it's the, the sense that I'm not sure what it is about 
areas outside of the southeast, but uh, Mississippi for a long time has suffered various uh, stereotypes. But if you thought Mississippi was rural, let me introduce you to Indiana. Um, so this is the local rural king. Uh, anyone here been to a rural king? Um, so are they in Mississippi? Tennessee. Tennessee. Okay. Coming, though, probably. <laughs> yeah. So this is like a local seed and feed store on the level of a Walmart where you can find, I actually love Rural King, you can find pretty much anything there from rabbits to deer stands to, to everything else. Um, there's also a presence of the Amish in Indiana, so it's not uncommon to see buggies going down the road or uh, men in the field with horses plowing. So Indiana is, a, I think, a very rural state. And here's now, to draw a parallel between red and rural and blue and city can be pretty tenuous, so take all of this with a grain of salt. Here's the last presidential election, and this is how Indiana went. So you can see up here at the top, here's South Bend, where the University of Notre Dame is located. Um, it went Democrat by 231 votes out of over 109,000 cast. You can see Gary, Indiana up here. Indianapolis, the state capital, the largest urban center. Uh, anyone care to guess what's in this county? What's that? Bloomington, Bloomington where Indiana University is located. Uh, so you can see that this, um, uh, that Indiana is a fairly conservative state. One of the things that I I don't know, I don't, I don't know if I'd like to say it, but there's one state in the union that had more KKK members than Mississippi, and it was Indiana. Here's Mississippi. Octibaha County, uh, I think we're located in Octibaha County. Uh, you can see that it barely went uh, Democrat, um, also decided by under 300 votes. Uh, not as many libertarians in Mississippi as there are in Indiana. Um, and, and remember, um, these Results are going to be a bit skewed because the vice presidential candidate was the governor, sitting governor of Indiana uh, at the time, Mike Pence. But there's good news about America. This is from a talk that Dave Campbell, who's the chair of the political science department at Notre Dame, gave uh, uh, late last year. Uh, he's looked extensively at, at American politics. Americans are closely divided, but that's not the same as deeply divided. Americans are not very ideological but we are partisan. And one of the exhibits that would be uh, Donald Trump, who doesn't seem to hold to a Republican orthodoxy. Religion is less a source of division than it appears, but it can be a source of division. And I think it's important that we recognize that religion plays a fundamental uh, part in many people's lives and that, it's, uh, that we need to recognize that. There was a, at the AAAS meeting, there was a panel about presenting evolution and bringing out in the open people's religious views. Um, it doesn't help if someone says that the earth is 6,000 years old that you call them a moron because then discussion completely stops. Uh, you invite participation. We've discovered that it doesn't matter how many facts you throw at someone. If it violates a fundamental belief system, they're not going to change their mind. So one of the things is engagement. that We want to talk to people. So if we look at uh, a more nuanced picture, and this is more in line with Dave Campbell's or uh, idea that America is purple rather than blue and, blue and red. We have to add some colors, so the light pink, you can see not even a, a Republican majority there. Uh, light blue, not even a Democratic majority, and then the blue. And then you look at Mississippi, you have to even introduce more colors. Uh, you go from the light pink to the brick red. So you can see the various counties in here, so the, the light pink here and then the brick red uh, the darker red down here, so where majorities are 80 to 90 percent. So put them, putting them together, the, there's not an easy way to discern what people are thinking. Um, this is perhaps a convenient way to get at uh, the idea of partisanship, of what, how people lean, what it is that's important to them. And so by knowing this, I think we can better engage uh, these individuals. I mean, it's our responsibility, and I don't do this as nearly as much as I could, to go into every single state in Indiana, in all 80 
or every single county in Indiana and all 82 counties in Mississippi and share it is what it is we do, the importance of, of science and, and intellectual pursuit. So here's my story. And I think each of you will go have, have your own story. And please be thinking about how you can ad adapt. It has to be personal and it has to be emotional for when, the way that you spread um, the humanities and the history of science. So here's uh, District 3, of which we are a part. Uh, I was born in Natchez uh, on the Mississippi River. My father was a hospital administrator who was uh, brought to Natchez from Baton Rouge. People in Baton Rouge told him that they will never accept you in Natchez. Um, he was to build the Jeff Davis Memorial Hospital in Natchez. And so that's what he was doing there. Uh, when I was three, we moved up to Jackson, where I spent my formative years going to Hattie Casey Elementary School and then to uh, Jackson Prep, and then we left the state for, for Texas. So you can see District 3 spans almost the entirety of Mississippi. So here's something from the Tippehaw County website. The proud home of Starkville and Mississippi State University, the largest university in the state. Well, I looked up Mississippi's Institute for Higher Learning and they don't agree with that. Uh, but if you take out Ole Miss's medical school, then I guess MSU is, is the, bigger, the bigger school. Is there any, do we have any pushback against that? Is a, does anyone really care? No. Okay. <laughs> Affordable housing, that's, uh, that's an appeal. Emphasis on health and diversity, a well-educated workforce, a rich mixture of nature, history. I mean, the, the Chamber of Commerce, the people in the county think that history is an important component of, of the county. Athletics, not a big surprise, and uh, art events. So, Octibaha was originally a part of the lands that belonged to the Choctaw. <coughs> Uh, it takes its name from the creek in the northern part of the county, which formed the boundary between the Choctaws and the Chickasaw. Has anyone ever been in Octipico Creek? Anyone been in it? Is it really cold? Yeah. It's supposed to be cold. Uh, it's been estimated in 1820 there were between 1,000 and 1,500 Choctaws living within the county's uh, present day borders. So here's what it looked like superimposed on the current figure of Mississippi. Choctaw Nation in 1800. This was one of the more powerful um, Native American tribes in, in the country at this time. Um, very uh, strong and, and influential. So in, in 1798, Vice President Thomas Jefferson, uh, Vice President to John Adams, was trying to make contact with individuals who could provide information on the Old Southwest, especially Indian languages, because Jefferson recognized early on it's essential that we be able to communicate to the Native Americans uh, because there are lots of people pouring in and that we need to be able to arrange uh, different agreements, treaties, uh, with the, the Native population. Uh, his letter of inquiry makes it to Daniel Clark, a New Orleans merchant, who writes back Jefferson said, the person you need to talk to is William Dunbar. So here's William Dunbar here. Now this is where the story gets a little bit complicated. Uh, I'm going to start by reading you the epitaph on his grave marker, which is still visible down near Washington, Mississippi. Uh, it's in, on the grounds of his plantation, which was called the forest. It reads, his life laments a tender husband, his children an affectionate parent, his friends a valuable acquaintance, his country a most useful citizen, and science a distinguished votary. So you can see the language here, votary, is almost of a religious element that Dunbar was dedicated to science in almost a religious way. Now, the complication with Dunbar is that he's used in uh, Toni Morrison's book, Playing in the Dark, Whiteness and the Literary Imagination, as a metaphor, a metaphor that you can't really understand American literature until you understand what the context is here. Dunbar is a metaphor for whiteness, for individualism, and for ambiguous morality. So he's a slave owner. And, and Morrison uses an account of a supposed slave insurrection in 1776, shortly before the Declaration of Independence is, is signed, to use this as the metaphor, the power of people like, like Dunbar. 
So let me tell you a little bit about him. He's born in, in Elgin, which is the top here, close to the North Sea. And he's the son of Sir Archibald Dunbar, Dunbar who is a, could trace his line back to the 8th, uh, 9th century. He's um, very studious. William is very studious. He's a collector, uh, likes to read, which is something that his father doesn't particularly like. He goes to King's College, which is in Aberdeen, in 1763, uh, 1767. This is about typical, 14 or so years old before uh, the age when you began higher education. You can think about what you were doing when you were 14. Um, Aberdeen is a part of what's called the Scottish Enlightenment of the mid-18th century, and this is a, a huge influx and, 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 and flurry of in innovation and thought and, and, and ideas and philosophy that are hugely influential in the uh, formation of the American Republic. And uh, Aberdeen is not the epicenter, Edinburgh is, but Aberdeen is a satellite of this Scottish Enlightenment and Dunbar, I think, soaks that up. He has uh, a chance after he graduates to study further in London, and he does, probably astronomy and mathematics. He's uh, the fourth son of Archibald Dunbar. So the ro rule of primogeniture is that the eldest son inherits all the land, and there's considerable land here, but three brothers stand in his way. The first two die, and then the third gets really sick. Uh, so Dunbar is kind of hanging around, but he recovers, the brother recovers, and so Dunbar really doesn't have any other thing to do but to, to try to find his life in a new land. So his father gives him uh, 2,000 pounds, which is hard to, to create an equivalent, but it's a considerable sum of money back in the 1770s. Um, he comes to North America. Uh, he lands in Philadelphia. He uses the money to buy goods to trade with the Native American population. He does that, increasing his, uh, his income. He goes to Pittsburgh. Uh, most of the people who are coming to Mississippi are coming through Pittsburgh, down the Ohio and then down the Mississippi River at the time. Um, he settles in land that's called West Florida. So the British are in control of this part of North America during this time period. It's very complicated. You, know, you have the Spanish, the French, and then the British as a result of the Seven Years' War. Um, uh, are able to take control of this part of North America. Um, the, the problem is, is that maps are not very good back then, and so boundaries are hard to, hard to define. It, the intent is that Hill Dunbar was settled beneath the 31st parallel, which you can recognize as the southern, um, most of the southern border of Mississippi and Alabama. And so he does. He settles in a place called New Richmond, which is close to where Baton Rouge is today. Um, he starts with indigo, which is what pretty much everyone was uh, trying to make money with back then, and then switches to scantling, uh, barrel staves. Uh, pretty much everything that was shipped back then was shipped through barrels, and Dunbar said that you could make a fortune manufacturing barrel staves, which is a very difficult thing to do, chopping trees and then riving them to uh, create, create barrel staves. He continues, he's a surveyor, which gives him a huge advantage. And if you're able to survey the land, uh, then you pretty much get first dibs on the, on the uh, premium property. Uh, he comes to the notice of the, the lands changing back and forth. It's also an advantage when you have French property lines over Spanish property lines, over American property lines, even Georgia. State of Georgia tried to claim all of this area for its own, and so you had Georgia property lines. So surveying skill was a, a great way to advance your career back then. Uh, after a lot of uh, stuff I won't go into between Spain and the United States, uh, the United States says we need to have a definite boundary for where the country ends. And Spain agrees, and we need to know where our uh, country ends too. And so they send, U.S. sends Andrew Ellicott, Quaker, uh, who's the uh, geographer for the country. Uh, Spain doesn't have anyone, so they appoint Dunbar uh, because he has the equipment, and he becomes the Spanish representative for the, um, 
uh, establishing that, that southern border. And they meet at Clarksville, which is a ghost town now, but it's named after Daniel Clark, who we saw earlier, who had bought all of that territory. And they begin the survey. If you go on the Natchez Trace, uh, outside down by the Barnett Reservoir, Os Barnett Reservoir, you can still see a sign that speaks to this uh, uh, western boundary where the, where the survey crews were uh, um, engaged in activity. So Ellicott reports back, the, he's met this Scotman, Scotsman down in the lower Mississippi Territory, and he recommends Dunbar for election to the American Philosophical Society. Uh, he lets Jefferson know about it. Jefferson writes Dunbar, following up on Clark's um, uh, suggestion. And Dunbar writes back, it is highly gratifying to be invited by a person of your high reputation in the Republic of Letters to contribute in conducting philosophical researches in this and the neighboring country. But my constant occupation as a planner since my residence in this country somewhat disqualified me for scientific pursuit. So this is a little bit disingenuous because he's been um, actively involved in scientific pursuits throughout, but he is running a, a plantation. But the thing is that he, um, in 1795, he puts in his letter book, just came back from a neighbor looking at a, uh, a cotton gin. And this is one of the earlier references to this, um, the Whitney gin, where you trans, uh, it allows uh, them to plant all of their acreage practically in cotton. So you transition from scantling to cotton, and Dunbar becomes fabulously wealthy, but he does it because he's in a slave society. It's the, the labor there that allows him to buy scientific instruments that cost more than what the royal astronomer in England makes in a year. And back to the, to the Choctaws and the Native Americans, Jefferson writes Dunbar, who's given him information, given Jefferson information, your letter gives me the first information I've ever had of the language by signs used among the Indians. So Jefferson is intrigued by this. And he continues, philosophical vedette centuries at the distance of 1,000 miles on the ver verge of terra incognita of our continent is precious to us here in Washington. I have never been a punctual correspondent, and it is possible that new duties may make me less so. So Jefferson is a longtime president of the American Philosophical Society, which he loved. I think he liked it more than being president. Uh, but the new duties, is, he's become president of the United States. But Dunbar, uh, because of all the, the turmoil and the, the chaos in the area, he's impeded by the factional politics. It is grievous, he wrote, when the demon of party spirit stalks over the land, it will be always found to originate with men of despicable talents who despair by other means of raising themselves into popular estimation. So he was happy in any country that could have a, a well-ordered government. He was sacked by the Spanish. He was sacked by the Americans. Uh, in one case, he said he didn't have a shirt left for his back. Uh, he just wanted an ordered society in which to, to work. The political quarrels, which uh, continued in what we saw in the Mississippi society, uh, they also hampered the seminary that uh, Claiborne wanted to, to found. It was uh, chartered in 1802, didn't begin operations until 1811, but it was Mississippi's first institution of higher learning. Uh, it didn't reach the aspirations of, of people like Dunbar and Claiborne. Uh, it became more of a preparatory academy and then a military school, and then it lasted as a military school for a very long time, finally closing in 64. And you can still visit the grounds of Jefferson College. Uh, they uh, have guided tours and things like that for it. So what are some of the lessons that we have here? In the midst of deep political turmoil following the election of 1800, Federalists and Republicans joined together to foster science. They were united in the pursuit of science. Partisanship can derail science, and we must build coalitions with our opponents. Even the bitterest of politics, and this is an important lesson, has not stopped science in the U.S. AAAS and the Hatch Act, which Alan tells me we're celebrating, of 1885, uh, where the federal government granted funds to state land-grant universities to create experimental stations devoted to agriculture. These things, uh, I think, Science in America is still the envy of the world, and so even though there's been lots of partisanship in the past, we uh, still seem to be succeeding. This is a quote that, uh, there was a recent article about the uh, review of uh, Hamilton, the musical. Uh, History is alive 
only when it is in dialogue with the present. History is less like something you learn than something you do that you take part in, a terrifying notion if you are inclined toward the status quo. So let me see if I can explore this terrifying notion somewhat here. So this is my second grade class at Hattie Casey Elementary School in Jackson in 1967. There I am, next to Bill Bogan. Uh, so I was seven then. There were three things that I believed when I was seven that it didn't matter what you told me, I would believe them. Uh, the South won the Civil War. The U.S. did not drop an atomic bomb on Japan. And that as soon as the older generation died out, and that's pretty much anyone 25 and older, uh, racism would beat an end in Mississippi. And so I kind of, I, so I don't believe any of that anymore. Um, I don't remember when I uh, converted from the first two thoughts. I remember vividly when I was standing on a street corner in, in Jackson talking to a friend of mine, and his little brother uttered a, a racial epithet, and it's, it's like a slap in the face. I thought, oh my God, it's not going to die out, because this kid is reproducing what his parents have done. So I was a, a byproduct of the um, 1970s when Jackson tried to start integrating schools. And instead of uh, introducing um, African-American students to school, they, they introduced African-American teachers. And, and, and it strikes me how much courage these people had of coming into a school with a lot of white kids and teaching us. And so you would see an African-American teacher with a bunch of white kids like this. I've been curious about Casey and how Casey's been faring, so I looked it up. So it was the state's only blue ribbon school last year. So it's succeeding very well. What struck me about this picture is this very tired looking woman <laughs> st standing amidst um, these students. And I'm thinking, this isn't quite what I would hope, that there would be more of a, a mixture of individuals here, that it wouldn't be from 50 years ago an African-American teacher and white students to a white teacher and African-American students. So what can we do about this? Um, so I've chosen, I think history is important because it gives us a chance for self-discovery. And that's one of the reasons I chose a Mississippi topic is to try to understand what was going on in Mississippi in the 60s. Um, I was totally oblivious, I mean, I was young, but it's just the more I learned about it, the more amazed I am of what was going along. But in the history of science, which everyone I think can get behind, and this is from um, some notes that our former president, Lynn Nyhart at the University of Wisconsin uh, put in our newsletter, explores the humanity behind science and helps us understand why the road to discovery is a tortuous one, provides long-term perspectives on ideas and trends, some of which the actors were unaware, and helps us connect the present to the past, attends to the relationship between science and power, which I think is extremely important, and invites reflection on the leading values attached to science. So the National Endowment for the Humanities, which celebrated its 50th anniversary, um, 2015, was, was formed because, you know, ap on the uh, aftermath of Sputnik and everyone was panicking because there was a missile gap and we had to catch up to the Russians. There was a strong sense, particularly among the scientific community, that we needed to pay attention to the humanity in science. Glenn Seaborg, who was the head of the AEC back then, was testifying to Congress about the need to establish a national endowment for the humanities. He said, we cannot afford to drift physically, morally, morally, or aesthetically in a world in which the current moves so rapidly, perhaps towards an abyss. Science and technology are providing us the means to travel swiftly, but what course do we take? This is the question that no computer can answer. So our task is to understand what the humanities bring to our lives, what the study of science can do to enhance it, and to enhance our lives and to bring us together to create a healthy republic. It's not, an, it's not an easy task, but one of the things that I've admired 
here at Mississippi State and what Allen has done is building a department of historians of science and of technology and, and environment and of medicine who are dedicated to this, really, really good people. And I'm pretty much aware of all the people who study the history of science and practice the history of science in the world. Uh, and to have this uh, in Mississippi is very meaningful to me. Thanks. <laughs>